My name is Rafael Lozano Hammer. I'm a Mexican-Canadian artist who's been working for the past 20 years in what I call the intersection of performance art and architecture. So I'm interested in being able to create environments which are connective, where people um, get to um, occupy the space, take it over, and reinterpret it, construct it, read it, criticize it. Um, so in my work, the audience is always an integral part of the artwork. Um, I've been working mostly in public space, so most of my work has taken place along um, events such as biennials or festivals or uh, memorials. And oftentimes I use technologies which are mostly corporate technologies of like large-scale projections or searchlights or, or uh, big sound systems. And I try and create um, projects which are intimate instead of intimidating. Um, I'm very much interested in the idea of people um, using these technologies to amplify their um, presence into an urban scale. And then for the past eight years, I've been working inside of galleries and museums and just sort of more traditional contemporary art events, oftentimes with the same kind of themes, but in a different scale, in a scale that is a little bit more um, suitable for a museum. Recorders is an exhibition which presents 12 installations that uh, all have something in common, which is that they are crowdsourced. The content of this work is entirely derived from the public itself. So in this piece right here, we have these microphones, which in fact, as you speak into them, they're listening to you and they're recording you. And then they play back from the head a recording from the past. Each of the microphones can store 600,000 voices from the past. So for example, I have one of these microphones at my studio. And about three years ago, my mother came to visit the studio and she said some things onto the mic. And nowadays, I can talk into the mic and sometimes my mother's voice comes out, which is really weird because she just passed away and so it's straight out of, you know, like send you straight to psychotherapy, you know, because the piece grows with participation. So here in Sydney, we start with nothing, and then as people say, hello, how are you? They start getting the echoes from people in the past, they understand the mechanism, and then they start saying some interesting things and the piece starts getting some content. Now, in my work, I don't always work with recorders. I have other typologies of work. I have um, another show called Trackers, which is not about the recorded memory, but about the live, um, the live moment. So these are pieces that are much more um, surveillance heavy and they have to do more with live processing. I have other shows. I have a show called Performers. I have Generators, Crashers, uh, Glories. So different classifications of my work, but in Australia, for Sydney, we've chosen to only highlight pieces which are recorders to, to sort of give um, people a thread, uh, the repetition of a technique, and in a way make the project have, um, have a broader statement about participation and culture. We have two works that are premiering at the MCA Recorders exhibition. Um, one of the pieces is called Tape Recorders, and it's an installation featuring dozens of motorized measuring tapes which basically detect the presence of visitors in front of them and telescope out um, automatically um, in such a way that they measure not the distance but the time that people are in the room. And what happens is as they telescope up, they become quite unstable. And once they reach about three or four meters, they come crashing down onto the public. So it's a piece which measures the time and uh, every hour it does uh, uh, metrics on how long people wasted in the room and it prints it out on a little tape uh, in the room. So that's tape recorders. And tape recorders is a piece that um, it's specifically a crasher. We like the crashing, we like the tension of surveillance being materialized by a really a uh, fragile uh, motion, which we're all familiar with, which is that moment where the measuring tape crashes and it makes a nice sound as well.
The second piece that we're premiering um, here at the MCA is called Voice Array, and it's an installation featuring hundreds of um, light-emitting diodes, LED lights, tiny lights, each of which is controlled by a voice recording. So you basically have, as a visitor, um, intercom. You speak into the intercom. Your voice is controlling the intensity of the lights, and then your recording is assigned to one of those lights. And everybody who, perf who performed before you gets pushed down one position in the queue, and you hear the voice of the last one who participated. So it's kind of like this, you know, hundreds of voices being visualized by blinking lights, by um, sort of motion in the, in the room. And then you can hear them through this, uh, through this installation. Um, if no one participates, there's nothing to see, because it is the voices that actually bring to life the whole installation of Voice Array. I think that um, museums and art historians and critics and artists and museum directors often have a condescending and paternalistic attitude toward the public. If you look at uh, how we think about the public, oftentimes we are interested in statistics, how many came through the door. We're interested in, you know, whether they went through the gift shop and so on. But I think it's really important to open up the museum for the public to self-represent, for the public to be the emphasis of the exhibition. This particular show, Recorders, is a show that is entirely crowdsourced, which means that all of the content comes from the public. For me, that's important because it sets out a relationship of complicity. There is a sensation that there is a, a, a platform that then gets populated. In a sense, the Artwork becomes like a public space, a space for expression, a space for connection, a space for surprises of different kinds of people who visit the uh, installation, do different kinds of things with them. And um, that's what I think is vibrant and, and uh, I, I'd, I'd hate to use the word democratic, but it's open, let's say. Let's say it's open and connective. It's something that doesn't tell you didactically or pedagogically like a monologue of you know, this is what's really important to highlight in our culture. But it highlights itself the participation. And I think that we're living in a culture where, um, where that's key, you know, where people um, are having a sense of agency, where people feel like they can contribute. And this show is an experiment to see if that really works in a museum. Giving a preeminent role to the spectator is a humbling affair because, in a way, you don't control it. You um, must be open um, to all kinds of participation. Uh, it's a project where you cannot be prescriptive about the outcome. Some people find that the projects are very violent or predatorial or Orwellian because they're extracting your image and in a way stealing um, you know, your own presence. Others think that the projects are fun and playful and, uh, you know, they do shout outs or they participate in it. The fun part for me as, as, um, as a developer is to sit back and just let the pieces have their own life, to, to not try and, and control people or censor or moderate in any way, but just let the pieces speak for themselves and then for the people to have that freedom to, to represent themselves. In most of my work, we're using either existing technologies, typically coming from surveillance, from corporate or government, military surveillance. Um, and uh, other times, we're developing our own technologies. Um, one technology that I would really love to get my hands on is drones. Um, I would uh, very much appreciate the capability to have a mobile platform for camera surveillance overhead that allows the public to, uh, for instance, have um, access to information which is um, strategically important. I'm thinking, for example, with protests. Uh, routinely, governments and police uh, departments uh, give a count, a head count, of how many people came to a protest. I would adore for that technology to be in the hands of the organizers of the protest, to be able to have real metrics and real counts. Mm -hmm. So the way this would work is drones which do head counts live during a protest and then send that data directly to the internet without the mediation of power. To me that would be a very liberating technology because it would allow you to you know, use the very technologies of control 
for um, legitimating certain social movements, such as, for instance, Indignation and Oc Occupy uh, Wall Street, which uh, I think are the real uh, stories of our time. I, I work with technology not because it's new or original or gadgety. I mean, obviously, I am a nerdy guy and I love uh, you know new developments. But the, at the same time, I work with it because it's inevitable. I work with it because it's part of our society. It's the language of globalization. Our uh, environment, our politics, our culture, our economy is all con interconnected through these technologies. And it's impossible to pretend that we are outside of them. So oftentimes people say, well, you're a technological artist. And it's like, well, this is a technological culture. Um, culture um, which, for instance, if you're a painter and you have your canvas, your public watches eight hours of screen time a day. So it's not like we know, you know what it's like to be outside of the culture of technology. So I work with it just to be consistent with that. Now, having said that, there are um, certain developments in technology which I do find are problematic and they do offer sort of novel techniques and strategies. Um, specifically in surveillance, um, we have had 46 years of tradition working with live cameras in exhibition spaces. The artist Marta Minujin from Buenos Aires first used live cameras before Nan Jun Pike and Dan Graham and all those guys, they were excellent. But before that, Marta Minujin had used a live camera of CCTV, of closed circuit television, to actually track the, the people in the exhibition live and represent them um, at the installation called Minnesota. So there is a tradition of artists who are misusing that kind of CCTV surveillance. So I was mentioning Dan Graham, but there's Julia Scher, there's Bruce Nauman did some great um, camera work. But today, that kind of camera no longer really exists. Um, the camera that is the problem now is, in my opinion, what Manuel de Landa likes to um, talk, the, the camera with executive decision-making. Mm -hmm. These are cameras which have computer processing built in. And in that process, processing, there is built-in prejudices. For instance, cameras today try to detect your ethnic origin. Cameras today try to compare you quickly to a database of suspicious individuals. There's all this different profiling and all these automatisms built into the cameras which crystallize and materialize our problems as a society. So from my perspective, what's really important is for artists to accept the challenge of misusing those technologies, to take that computer vision and instead of creating environments of suspicion, create environments that are critical or poetic or connected. Mm. So I think that we are witnessing a big change in how surveillance is being used by our society from the sort of authorities watching it, kind of like Orwell described, to the computers watching it, which is way more problematic and insidious. So in my show, my contribution to the sort of big, you know, 46-year-old tradition of surveillance and art is to try and use algorithms, face tracking, biometrics, all of these different technologies that are being used, especially after Patriot Act and Homeland Security, um, to create this new kind of uh, experiences. I have a project at the MCA, um, it's called People on People, and it's one of, um, it's an installation with a shadow play, uh, not unlike the kind of uh, shadow plays that I've been doing in public space for quite a while. The shadow plays are typically uh, works in which inside of your shadow you see portraits of other people, or texts, or you're controlling radio frequencies or something like that. For the MCA recorders, we have a project called People on People where inside of your shadow you see recorded and live imagery of people who have been at the piece in the past. And, you know, these works are interesting because shadows are very intuitive for people to participate. Most of my works and most of my colleagues' works in new media, you have to have instructions about what to do and not to do and so on. But shadows, you know, most cultures have a very sophisticated language of, of shadow puppetry or shadow theater. We, everybody does little shadow puppets at home or whatnot. So there is a sense of, of immediacy, of intimacy. Everybody sort of knows what to do. Um, but when you're in an installation in a museum, you know, people are a little bit more controlled than they might be in public space. So, you know, they're, they're aware of, uh, you know, certain kind of limits of what we can do in, in, in a museum. 
But yet, when you're in front of your shadow, when you see that this scanner is picking up your image, um, people will begin to play a lot more than, than you know, so say in a conventional exhibition, because there's a sense of performance, there's a sense of, of absence and presence being mixed in the same piece. And you want to record yourself in a way that you leave something behind that you might come back in the future and see yourself. And when that happens, actually, when you and your past self are, are being mixed up, it's straight out of David Lynch. It's like really perverse and weird to see yourself uh, sharing space in the same installation. I'm definitely interested in being able to mix different media. I think that computers are really good at that, you know, to be able to create environments which mix sound and visuals and robots, movement, and so on. Um, the truth is that as a DJ, or as a, a frustrated DJ, because I'm not so good, um, I listen to a lot of music. I, I am genuinely um, very excited by, by music and my own background. My parents were nightclub owners and uh, I have a lot of composer friends. But I do know enough about music to know that I am no composer. <laughs> and this is a very important, actually, lesson for most new media artists who think they can create their own uh, sort of architectures of sound, um, I think that that really does demand a special talent. Much in the same way as I am a programmer, but I'm not very good at it. You know, I look at some of the engineers I work with and I know that's what a real programmer does. Or the same as with philosophy. I used to think I could make a contribution to theory and I would read a lot of philosophy. At one point, you just got to know, you got to specialize in something. And my specialty is not necessarily in any of those fields. Oftentimes, I do collaborate with composers, um, and, um, and I admire their specialty very much. Um, I think that my role is one of, uh, not unlike in the performing arts, I'm the director. And then there is actors and composers and writers, programmers, there's lighting designers. And, you know, you still have to sort of put all of that together into something that is cohesive. It's just that these pieces are not presented in a theater, they're not time-based, they're more event-based. They're presented in a museum for people to be the actors of the play. So uh, here at MCA, um, it's been quite an exciting setup because on the one hand, we've just finishing new rooms that have uh, sort of expanded the galleries. Um, so there's that. Then there is all of our work. It's actually quite intense because it's not like a normal artwork that you might just want to hang and light and just, you know, have your guides and, and so on. It's more like you actually have to build the piece on site. It's, it's almost as if you have to build the cinema and then make the movie all at the same time in that space. So for instance, at my studio, we've mocked up a lot of these things, we've calibrated, we've programmed, but it is only once we're in the place with, you know, big tall ceilings and large arrays that we can actually, you know, sort of fine tune all of it. So even during this interview, we're hearing all this noise going on. It's because contrary to a conventional show, this one, um, we have for each one of the pieces a lot of uh, things going on until the very last minute.